personal stuff in there first. Let's start with that. Okay. And then on Friday, it was beer bash time. And there was just a lot of beer. <laughs> so I'd go to these beer bashes and hang out. And, and I just, and, they, and the only thing, it was just the conversation consisted of like, what's up? Cool dude. What's up? Cool dude. That was it, you know. So I, I grew so frustrated with this that finally I would just, I just had to do something. And so I would go find some person at this beer bash and just sit down with him and say, how is your soul? <laughs> <laughs> and the crazy part is they would tell me. Whoa. Oh, it was crazy. They would just, it was just this explosion of, oh my God, somebody asked me something besides, what's up, dude? So can you tell? Oh my God. Can you tell? Because you, I'm assuming you weren't doing a formal experiment no, about this. No, not really. But no. could you tell how much of it was they were drunk? <clears throat> And how much of it was they were dying for someone to just ask them something meaningful about their life? Great question. I would say beer lubricated this, you know, it, it, it enhanced their willingness to spill the beans. Mm -hmm. But um, really what was obvious was that they were starving, starving for some kind of connection. Yeah. That was more meaningful, and it was just amazing. I would just you know, so I just kept doing that with these beer bashes and had a good time. But you know, as far as maintaining any kind of connection with these people, it was tough. You know. So you were able to make those you yeah. initiated those initial connections. I had convos, yeah. And were able to get it from small talk into something deeper. Deep. But then it's another skill, right? Like how do yes. you Yes. How do you maintain touch? that? How do, how do you go deeper? Now, I, again, I already had friends. Yeah. And I had a friend of mine that came with me, you know, that I came with actually to UC Riverside. So he and I were very tight and we we're hanging out all the time. So I, you know, I was never, I never felt particularly lonely, uh -huh. but I did feel disengaged yeah. from university life, you know, except going yeah. to class. So that was my saga. And so, it does color the way I look at, at things here. You know, I can relate right. to students that are having this trouble. And so, Kat. Yes. So you were a student here. I sure was. What was it like at USC when, for you as a student, as an undergraduate? Oh my gosh. Well, I did not know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> I had never been to Southern California, and my family did not have much money at all, so I packed a gigantic suitcase, not even the kind that rolls. It was just like a gigantic suitcase. <laughs> And I got off the super shuttle at gate three alone. You remember the gate? That's gate fun. three. I was in New North on the second floor uh, in a single dorm room, which uh, is rare. So I was by myself in the dorm. I had no family that came with me. And I'm lugging this gigantic suitcase up two flights of stairs and just at a com knew no one here. Right, had no family connections here, had no friends that were also coming here. Um, just at a complete and total loss for what to do. All I knew is that the dining hall was in the bottom of my building and I knew what my class schedule was. And I was just, I would see these people like Whoa. riding their bicycles with each other on campus. And I'm like, how do they know where they're going? Where are they going? How did they find each other? I was just mystified and had no clue what, how, to, how to connect. I just really was clueless. And I was, had a lot of social anxiety. I was um, very nervous to initiate with anyone. But beyond that, I was so afraid of people at that point in my life that I would sabotage other people's efforts to connect with me. So I would go to EVK and I would put textbooks on all the seats around me to make it look like people were sitting there so that no one else would sit down next oh, to me. Because no. I was so oh. afraid of just oh. having to uh, open oh, up and, and get to know someone ha and ha let them get to know me. So I was sabotaging all of the you know usual mechanisms that we have for, for making friends. and. 
you know, I would rollerblade to camp, uh, to class on back alleys to avoid Truesdale Parkway. Wow. I just was not anywhere in a space where I could even go to an orientation fair or try out a bunch of groups. Like, I just, I was barely surviving socially. And I met one professor my freshman year who was just the warmest, kindest, sincerest man. And he was a philosophy professor, Dr. Dallas Willard, who taught here for over 40 years. Beloved professor. And I wasn't even a philosophy major. But someone had ran into me in a library, in the Hoos library, because I was like in a little cubicle in Hoos reading all these dead white man thinkers, you know, (laughs) hoping to connect somehow through reading those texts. And he invited me downstairs to a class Dallas was teaching. And he became, and I, so I switched to become a philosophy major just to stay connected with him and learn how to live life. And he was my one like anchor or tether where I could, he, he just had this amazing open door policy for office hours where his door was always open and I w- went to every single one of his office hours and I, I would, and he sort of like had a 15 minute thing that he did so that everyone could get to see him and I would exhaust the 15 minutes every single time and I would scribble furiously in my notebook every single thing he told me I would go in and just ask him every question about life <laughs> and the universe. That's great. And um, he just accepted me. Yeah. Right? And more than that, he respected me as a person in all my perceived, you know, saw me. Yeah. Yeah. And so. As he, is. As is. Yeah. He's the, he's the reason I didn't drop out. And I, so I did, my honor, yeah. <laughs> I did my honors thesis with him on the conditions for community oh. while having zero friends at USC. And I just, it was always in my heart, like I, I knew I needed it for myself, but I knew it was somehow this really profound solution that the world needed. And so he let me study that with him. Um, and so I ended up meeting a couple people, an extrovert on steroids, finally sat down next to me at EVK and didn't care that my books were there. And he's someone, he's one of these people who knew probably every person on campus <laughs> by name. We all know one of those people. <laughs> we can call them <coughs> port- <laughs> por- portals yeah. or super connectors. Yeah. But it's really good to find one of those people because then you can just ride their coattails into, <laughs> into all of the social yeah, social yeah. things and they'll be a guide, you know, uh-huh. and help facilitate that for you. But he brought me to some kind of thing on the substance free floor of New North <laughs> where he his closest friends were. And I think uh, they were watching a YouTube montage of, of this guy called The Farting Preacher. <laughs> It was this montage of a tele- tele-evangelist yeah. who they dubbed over anyway. I, I met know. a couple friends who were just very kind, good people across various disciplines. And those were my couple friends that I had here. So by and large, I really, really struggled. And I just couldn't figure it out. I was so, so closed in within myself. I couldn't even yeah. figure yeah. out how to, how to get out. And so, you know, then my life uh, took a very different, different turn. I think what really triggered me on, on this was talking to a student who was a friend of a student who committed suicide. And this student, I was I'm close to her, I know her very well. And she says, Jim, I thought I knew that girl. I thought I knew her. Yeah. But I didn't. I didn't know how bad things were for her. I thought I was her friend. But now I question that. I really wonder how deep we had gone, how very deep. Yeah. And that just very much affected and touched me. I go, okay, let's get serious about this piece of it. And started doing a lot of research. Yeah. Reading the philosophers with you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, 
Augustine, and, you know, I mean uh, Aristotle, excuse me, um, in particular, and the ethics has a lot to say about this. So there's a lot of deep thought that's gone into this question of what makes for friendship. And uh, so I started reading, looking at research, and uh, discovered this, this whole meme of the campfire is kind of perfect in a way. So a campfire, you know, you just, in, in, a, in our relationship, you and I, we're friends, but you know, I can only do this so long with you, much, much as I like looking into your eyes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a point at which I need to like, take a break. Uh-huh. And that's it's what we intent, do. It's an intense yeah, kind of interaction. Yeah, it's too intense, you know, so you got to take a break from that, and that's what campfires are for. And you just stare at the campfire for a while, and you go, hmm, I don't think about that. So it's a way of, of uh, creating, creating a warmth that attracts you to connect, and at the same time gives you another focus. To, to give that air that you need in a relationship. And I feel like there's such a there's such a part of human history. Right? Yes. They're yes. very ancient. We've needed It's this. elemental. Yes. You know? And People have been drawn to fire in the community all the way back. So it's right. it's in there in the DNA and the mitochondria or whatever it is. Built in mm -hmm. to, to have this connection to campfires or fires in general. So right. that's why we picked the meme for that. And also as a way of repurposing <coughs> our, yeah, our smartphones. We, how would we do that? Well, we just go to uh, YouTube and go to virtual campfire with crackling fire sounds. There's a million other ones too you can use. I happen to like that one because I like the crackling. And then uh, that's how you turn your phone into a campfire phone. That's great. Uh, so what's the what would be the vision if campfires or where do you imagine campfires happening on campus or how can we use them or what would help us imagine what a campus that is you know embodying campfires and experiencing campfires what would that look like well uh, when we started this uh, we started by doing events and our first event was with you so events where we lift up the value of friendship and community building on the campus. Um, campfire themed events. Actually, we do have a fire on campus, a fire pit over at Parkside, and so we've used that for some of these events. Um, so events, and then we went forth and hired you as our consultant and teacher to teach the CLICK class about how to form meaningful relationships, uh, which has been a hit. You're awesome. I love it. And then we also then began um, uh, doing trainings for student leaders on campus. So we have uh, resident assistants here, uh, orientation advisors. We have student leaders of 1,200 clubs on campus. How do we train student leaders in the arts of campfire, community building, and friendship enhancement, to create the environment where friendship can happen. Right. And, you know, I, I've been to a bunch of student club meetings over the years, and I, I've been struck by how many of these clubs are like old-fashioned classrooms. You know, it's ironic. Uh, professors, at least some of them, have learned some up-to-date pedagogical techniques about how to run a classroom, but students haven't caught that yet. You know? right. So you go to these club meetings and it's all face forward. Somebody's up in front, talking head, or you know, somebody's presenting, and everybody's face forward. Well, that's not how you connect. That's not going to lead to people connecting. What would happen if the student leaders of these clubs go, "Hey, you know, part of why we're here is to connect, is to get our student members to know each other in some depth," you know, and go deeper in their connections with each other. So that actually involves um, intentional effort. So that's what we're starting to teach. How to, how to structure the spaces, how to communicate, yeah. how to ask questions, how to keep in touch. And, and these efforts. So now you're looking at where on campus can we find spaces that are right. conducive to these kinds of things, uh, to, this, to, to the development of these kinds of relationships. Right. And how do we change the culture here at the university to make it more of a thing, right? right. That that uh, that um, it's cool to be bold 
and to ask uh, perfect strangers to have a chat right. and get a convo started and see where it goes. Right. It's like uh, you can ask uh, you can ask somebody. You know, where I'm I'm trying to find my campfire. Could you help me? So maybe you're going to be in my campfire, or maybe not. But maybe you could help me find my campfire. My, a, a my group, circle of people. A, yeah, a group that you yeah, can really my go people. deep with. Yeah, mm -hmm. that I can connect with at some depth. Right. Friendship is all about vulnerability. Right. And uh, it's a delicate thing, right? A precious and delicate thing. Yeah. So how do we nurture that? Right, and I think part of what I love about what Campfires is trying to do is to just even validate people's experience, yeah, right? Yeah, and to be able right. to have conversations honestly about how we're doing. Yes. Uh, because one of the things that's most difficult about dealing with loneliness is that it's invisible. Right. Right, and we're not talking about it because there's stigma often associated with saying, I feel lonely, or we might not even realize that we're feeling lonely or disconnected, you know, and so Loneliness, it's everywhere, but it's nowhere. Well, and, right? and it's exacerbated, you know, it's really ironic in a place like this to be lonely when you're surrounded by, right. you know, tens of thousands of, of your peers. Right. right. So it's, all, it's worse, actually. Right. The, the loneliness of a crowd is worse than the loneliness of being all by yourself someplace. Right. And, 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 then, and then it's even even more rubbed, I think, in, in students' face when they realize, wow, um, I, I talk to people every day, I, you know, I say, what's up, but do I know anybody, you know, really? Right. Have I gotten down and dirty and vulnerable with anybody? Have I had a belly laugh lately with anybody, you know? Yeah. That's a whole different thing than saying, what's up, right? Right. And if we if we so, don't have a space where we can talk about those things yeah, and actually right. practice some of these skills of initiating with people and asking yeah. questions and what if this happens what if that happens yeah. you know it's it becomes even more difficult to then initiate if we feel like we don't have any resources for what to do if the conversation or interaction doesn't go exactly how we hope yeah. One big part of this is, is just questions, right? So uh, uh, we came up with this, yes? Uh, so these are sticky notes, and you write a question on here, an open-ended question that might lead to deeper connection with some other person. You write, it on, you write your question on here, and then you slap it against a wall to, to just to encourage people to ask. Most people want to be talked to, but we anticipate that most people don't. Right. Right? That we're going to be interrupting them or, yes. you know, somehow they're too busy or or are going to reject us somehow. But for the most part, this is a really fundamental human need. So even if you're not going to become best friends with someone, you know, the ability to move through all of your social spaces with a posture yeah. of friendliness and openness. You know, because even if it's not someone who is going to, you know, become part of your inner circle. Right. You have no idea that person could be grieving the loss of right. someone in their life or really stressed about school or any number of things. And just saying hello and asking them how they're doing could mean everything yes. to their quality of life in that moment, in that day, in that week. So I think there's a way in which we think about how can I form the relationships I need to thrive, you right, know, right. but also who do I have the opportunity to be for someone, mm -hmm. right? And it can be just these small interactions in, in these small distances that we all are already in with each other in the classroom, yeah. in the dorm, in the cafeteria, as we're just moving across campus where even look, looking at someone in the eye as you pass them yeah. is shown to increase that person's, who was looked at, their sense of belonging, right? Even yes. if you don't even Just talk to, to them, yeah. to, be, to be seen and then, you know, to be engaged. Yeah. 
yeah, you know, at all. <laughs> to be engaged at all, to have someone initiate with you. So I think, to the other side of it is, yeah. what are we capable of being for each other in the flow of our normal lives? Yeah. And so, you know, we're always looking for that kind of connection yeah. where someone else wants us and is seeing us and hearing us at that distance and our only job is to be right. to be ourselves and to be experienced being held you know as is as is as is with before no agenda before we can ever run fast get a good grade prove anything like we can't even support the weight of our own heads Right. <laughs> you know, and to experience being embraced. Yes. You know, that's that's what our our hearts or souls are always looking to get back to yeah. in a relationship. Yeah. You know, that that really basic first experience. Which yes. we can create for each other standing in line at Target. Right. You know? or around a campfire or in a dining hall or next to each other at class, you know, that experience of out of our own time and energy, creating a space to listen to someone else and attend to them. Where, where do you hope we go in uh, belonging at USC? Where are we headed together on this journey of campfires and friendship yeah. and community building? Well, I've just been so reassured and inspired that I think the more conversations we've been having with, with students, with staff, with faculty across the university, there's just a growing, not just awareness, but desire and readiness to be like, what, what can we make together? How can we be a solution uh -huh. for each other, right? And so I'm really excited to be bringing people together across the various layers and across student groups and ex student experiences to form those solutions together, right? And so that's how we're, I think, building everything that we're building. It's not like we're coming up with a theoretical idea of what should happen and then like implementing it. Right. We're having conversations with people and listening to them and together saying, what can we do in this context, in that context? So I'm really excited to be finding partners across the university. We're working now with the American Language Institute. We're partnering with hospitality to do um, a project in the cafeterias where we can set up some tables that are explicitly uh, social tables where we can ask each other questions, connect, check in on each other, see how we're doing. Um, so there's those partnerships that we're forming and I think yeah. the more we can find each other and create the solutions, you know, the more you're going to get uh, over time, like a shift that's going to normalize those experiences for people in whatever space that they're in. Yes. But if you had like one piece of advice that you feel like would be most universally helpful for students who are feeling lonely or struggling to connect, where would you tell them to start? I, I, would, I have given this, uh, this advice to many, many, many students over the years before we even got this going and, it, and it's still germane to this. That is, if you ask people questions, 99% of the time they love to answer you. Mm -hmm. Particularly if it's an open-ended, you know, if it's an interesting question, but, you know, there are a lot of interesting questions. They don't have to be, there's no rocket science here. It's simple to ask questions. You go to our website for campfires at USC, you'll see lists of lists of questions. Yes. So let me know how it's going. That leads me to, if people are struggling to find their campfire or yeah. don't really know where to begin, how, how can we help them get to the people who can help them? Well, yeah. How can they, they we can find come you? In here, they can walk in URC 106 and have a chat. And I, if I have not, if I'm not talking to somebody else, I'll talk to them. And they can come to your class, come to my which class. I send them to all the time, and say, "Check out this class. It is so much fun. It's amazing. It is a way to connect and a way to learn how to connect." Really, be brave 
and say, you know, be able to ask people like, hey, how, have you gotten connected here? Yeah. How did that work for you? I'm still trying to, to find my place. Do you have any ideas or do you know who I could talk to? I think most people like, right, being able to help, you know, so maybe they have answers, maybe they don't, but most people are, are willing to help with whatever um, has worked for them, if nothing yeah. else. It's like you say, it's human nature. In being brave to initiate any kind of contact with other people, you very well may be helping them oh, yeah. more than you're even going to be helping yourself. And so to understand your act of bravery, really, um, as an act of kindness as well, yes. we may have no idea what someone else is experiencing or feeling and to be able to to understand your own um, power to help someone else simply by checking in and saying how are you doing really this is how I'm doing um, can be everything yeah. so we really have so much um, that we can give each other in the act of just showing up for each other and caring. That really is the turning point of all of this. Light a fire. 